equally. There's a measurement there, which is the same as this measurement here. And that measurement there is quite uniform. It's, um, again, it's potentially boring. So this is what I mean by breaking it up um, or dropping the, the, the horizon line. Um, I personally probably uh, plumb for uh, going lower, taking the whole line down here somewhere. So all our information sits down here. Okay. Right, so I'm going to drop our line down here somewhere. Now then, that gives us a good expanse of sky. Um, and our focal point, you know, going on the grid, which is where we'd normally start, of course, we have our grid lines like this. And that grid line is quite nicely placed now because it's, that horizon line that I've chosen is on the grid line, which is good. Um, now, there's a few ways you can approach the, your sketch. Um, I like to sort of go across the top of the trees, the background, and it's an approximation. Um, what's really important if you're going to follow me with this, if you're going to do the same as me, is that the trees offer a very abstract edge, don't they? You know, I'm talking about this top edge against the sky. Whereas every time it falls on the roof of a building, you get a very geometrical line there, which we'll just place out for the moment as a line, a horizontal line here. Um, you can sort of see the reflected roof of that building, something like that, but the rest of it is in shadow. Then the trees pick up again. And I don't have to copy the tree line, but they're actually quite in a nice, they're quite nicely positioned. So um, there's another building here, but I want to show this building, the second building, as being a little bit closer to us. It'll give our painting a little more depth. So the, the first one where my finger is, I'm gonna suggest is pushed back a little bit into the background. Whereas this one, notice how it's slightly higher. So if I want to bring it forward, I have to make it bigger. So the horizontal line to the roof is higher than that one there. Okay. And it's bigger, of course, something like that. And again, I won't worry too much about uh, the rest of the shape of the building because it's in shadow down here like this. And then the only tree I don't like in here is the next tree. To me, it's a really, it's really odd. It's just a co an unfortunate coincidence that cre it creates a triangle, isn't it? It's a very triangular shape, something like that. And it comes off, comes directly off that angle of the roof there. Now that, that to me is just going to, you know, that, that, that saying, um, you know, a, 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 you, you have to lie. Um, that's what's in the photograph. That's what's there in real life. But I'm going to have to say, because of, because I know that it'll throw the viewer's eye. The viewer's eye is going to say, that's a bit weird. We don't question it in a photograph, but um, we would think it was odd in a, in a painting. Uh, be, you know, I won't go into why the brain thinks like that, but it's a fact. So I'm going to move the tree slightly, take the triangular shape out of it as well a bit. And, and give myself something like that. I, I, it, it must be because, you know, the, the reason why we um, have to change things to make things work is because I think the, the, the every, when it comes to looking at a painting, we automatically go into sort of critiquing it. And um, if there's a bad design or something that just doesn't please the eye, the viewer will, it's probably going to be inclined to think that um, the artist has got it wrong. It's quite interesting. And um, so, uh, and again, this is, this is one of the things that was meant when somebody very famous said, you know, a painting is a lie that tells the truth. Simply, mean, simply means that you can't always um, paint what you see because, um, because it will be questioned and doubted. Um, so there's another smaller building a bit further back here. Now, again, a little 
a skyline of smaller trees here, something like that. Quite like the, the, the tree over here right at the edge because the one at the edge acts as a bit of a punctuation mark. So the next thing we've got to consider here, of course, is the, um, the bales, the hay bales themselves. Now, the scale of them isn't enough. Um, so here we go again, bending the rules, changing what's actually in front of us to something that will be uh, better for the painting. So we need to increase their scale. I'm going to start with the nearest one, which I'm saying is here. There's the elliptical shape of the end of the bale. So it's not a perfect circle, okay? It might look it a little bit in the photograph, you know, the, the dark shadowed end of that bale, hay bale. Um, but it's more of an ellipse because of the weight of the mass of the straw, et cetera, is sort of doing more like an egg shape, if you like. Now, um, there's a very light top to that hay bale catching, you know, that, that, that face there, and that curvature is catching the light. Um, so there's my first hay bale. I'm gonna put one about here. I can go in close in a moment if you want to see this uh, a little more accurately. Um, so all these others are smaller and they're no more than just a, 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 a small ellipse, elliptical shape. Um, let's have a couple close together. They're quite regimented in a way. I, I dare say if you were there in the field and you were able to walk around, these hay bales are deposited in places um, quite in a, in a sort of uniform fashion. But um, of course that won't make for a great painting. So I'm placing mine out in a more um, pleasing, interesting um, fashion. But what a, you know, what an interesting shape that is in itself. And if I were just to isolate it on a piece of paper here, um, hang on, let me just show you. These hay bales are no more than this. You can see that. I won't think, I don't think about the bottom edge because that's a soft line at the bottom, okay? But that's what that's what we're looking at, something like that. that that's all each one of those bales um, offers. That, that's what you've got there as a, as a shape, as the most simplified, broken down shape. So don't, you know, don't, you don't have to start sort of inferring that there are, um, let me just get rid of the bottom of that bale a minute. Um, so don't worry about sort of texturing, if you like, for the moment anyway, um, the shape of that hay bale. Before we continue, please consider subscribing to my channel. And if you want immediate notifications as to when I upload a new video, then please remember to also click on the bell icon a little bit of raw sienna okay you don't need much um perhaps a little bit more than that you would if it was watercolor paint i have an atomizer on hand this is just a, a, a fine mist bottle sprayer um be, that that'll keep my paints uh, workable if i don't get you know if, if i don't use them quickly enough of course some of us i know possess stay wet palettes um if you've got a stay wet palette great um you still have to sort of spray them sometimes though even with stay wet palettes but this is my preferred way of painting it suits the way i paint so i'm starting off with a one inch flat okay um this is a synthetic fiber brush because i don't use my uh, watercolor brushes for this so i'm in the water i'm just picking up now I I, I get asked this a lot. Um, do I pre-wet my um, areas before I put my washes on? Well, I don't very often. Um, you can, uh, it's only me. Um, please don't take this as, uh, you know, the, the law. Um, you can, if you wish. It, it, what it does, if you pre-wet, it gives you a little bit more time to uh, apply your wash. 
Um, and I'm going to do that for those that pref wish to try it or, you know, want to see, see the, uh, how you work when it's pre-wet. Um, why do we pre-wet? Why can't we just go in on dry paper? Because it, I've developed, I paint very quickly, so I can get paint on and water on at the same time. And, and for me, my, that, the reason why I choose that the reason why I choose to work on dry, not pre-wet, is because I feel I get a little bit more texture in the pigment of the paint um, by going on dry paper. But um, I'm going to do the um, wet on wet. So I'm pre-wetting, it's picking up water, and I'm just going to bring this down to I think we'll bring this down to the tops of the background trees there, okay? I'm not being too careful about whether I go over the edge into the trees. As I say, this is uh, acrylic and um, we can certainly paint over any rough edges, but I'm doing that anyway. I'm, I'm sort of thinking of it as, as close as I can to like a watercolor style. So there we are. Um, if you're in a particularly dry room, a warm room, okay, you might just have to do that twice. Because what happens is um, when you're putting water on watercolor paper like this, for the first minute or so, it sits on the surface. It doesn't actually go into the paper. Um, do I do the foreground at the same time? Uh, I think not. This is my decision. I think not. I think we'll, we can pre-wet it but we'll uh, tackle the sky first and, and then the foreground, okay? So let's take a little bit of this um, ultramarine blue with plenty of water, okay? So I just picked up, took a small amount of paint on the corner of the brush, made sure that that paint came off the brush. You don't want it hanging around in the fibers of the brush. Break it down, okay? And then you pick up some water. That's a good, that's enough to start. So when I get down to, I don't know, around here somewhere, you'll probably see me pick up some, um, some raw sienna. So in it goes. The photo gives us a very peachy warm sky, okay? So I'm thinking perhaps what, we, what we'll do is we'll just put a little bit of um, alizarin crimson in this. So I'm just letting that sit there for a moment. I just get a little bit of uh, alizarin crimson. Mine, my top of my paint is stuck. So, pair of pliers, a little bit of alizarin crimson, and that'll give us when the when the two warm colors go in that alizarin crimson and the raw sienna, we'll get that sort of peachy effect. Let's go back to the blue for a moment. Just in here, and as I say, if I the longer I leave that, the more interest I can create in that sky. Look, the, the brush marks are actually stay in there, aren't they? That's because I just let it dry off. I let the water go into the paper a bit more. So let's look at um, a little bit of warming up from the raw sienna. I am going to get rid of the blue. And the reason for that is um, if I put the raw sienna on the blue, of course, I'll get green. I don't want a green looking sky. So a little bit of raw sienna. And that should just warm things up a tad down here. But make sure you just push up into the blue. Don't go, don't go right up here in, into the top of the sky, but just push into it from, from underneath like this. Okay. Now the little bit of alizarin crimson. I don't have to clean the palette for this. quite weak, it's very small amounts of paint, okay? But this will give it the peachy effect. I'm probably going to, um, I'm just gonna take some of that now, just one, two, three, four, you know, maximum five brush marks there as you push those colors upwards. But you should still see a bit of coolness at the top of the sky whilst the lower part of the sky is uh, a lot warmer. And I'm just making good around the edges there. 
You can see where I've gone over the trees a little bit on my drawing. That's absolutely fine. The only thing I'd say be careful of is don't go into the tops of your um, barns and farm buildings back there. Stay out of those, okay? I've gone over this one ever so slightly, but that's not my main building, so I'm not too worried about that. But you can now bring, you know, some of that paint down into this area because that's the start of your tonal value um, uh, for the backs of the uh, for the for the background, sorry, of the hay bales. Be very careful not to, to, to go over the hay bales. We will be going darker. This is nowhere near the finished tonal value, but it will, I always sort of use color that you see in the sky in the ground because it just keeps some cohesion so um let's paint the foreground and my warning to you all here is again like i say you can um you can pre-wet if you wish but um i don't want you going over the hay bales okay so there's that same weak wash that i just used a moment ago i think i'm going to clean that off and just make this a lot warmer with just the raw sienna So show you, I've just cleaned the one inch brush. I'm taking that, but this time I'm gonna add a little bit of our uh, other yellow, which I put on the list as I believe, I think it was lemon yellow or um, any, any pale yellow. I've got a color here called Hansa yellow, which is very, very similar to um, lemon yellow. But you could also use cadmium yellow light. I'd avoid any yellow that's moving towards orange. And just put out a little bit of this. That, that's more than I intended. It's just that the tube decided to uh, ooze out um, more paint. Okay, so this bit of yellow will bring a bit of sunlight to this um, foreground. Okay, in it goes, a quick mix like that. Beautiful golden color now with more water. So I'm picking up water. And where, as I say, we're going to, we, I mean, you, you could sort of make contact with the bottom of the hay bale if, if, you, if you like. But do make sure that that illuminated area of the hay bale is uh, free of paint. Go over the dark end of the hay bale as well, but stay out of that section that is um, that is the reflected light on on the back of the hay bale, along the spine, if you like, of the hay bale. So just carefully going around there. Now I can drag this down in a far more um, looser, uh, uh, easier fashion. I'm just gonna bring, probably just gonna stick to a few vertical brush strokes here. We won't worry about the, um, what I mentioned earlier, you know, the, um, the little ravine or whatever it is where the grass is growing. We're just paint over that completely as though it's not there for now. And then I'm just tidying up anywhere I think, you know, I don't really want, um, in some places a little bit of white paper glimmering through is, is gonna be fine. But I sort of tend to get rid of any white little dots from the, um, from the edges and leave only leave any little pockets of white paper in, in the interest area. Our focal point, like I say, um, is sort of round here. It, it's one of those paintings, and this is, I think this is a really good exercise for all of us because you know you, you'll you'll you will often be challenged by a, a scene where the focal point has to be slightly contrived, it has to be invented. Um, uh, and so a photo like this is really good for that. Um, it forces your creative mind to work. 
rather than you know everything is is given to you um, for you to copy. So because eventually um, you you will eventually have to leave that behind. If you you know as you develop as an artist, you have to um, you have to you will be required to call upon your creative side more and more. Okay, otherwise of course. The alternative, if you, if you don't apply creativity, if you don't find that creativity, um, everything you produce will be a copy of a photo or a copy of the reference that you, you're using. So that's why it's important to get these exercises in um, at every opportunity. If you can invent something that's not in the photo, invent it. Don't worry about whether it's gonna work or not. I'm, I'm serious about that. You just do it because over time and enough practice, you soon learn what does work and what doesn't work, but you can only learn by um, creating mistakes in the first place. Sometimes you get lucky and you just hit it firsthand. You know, it's, it's just, uh, it, it works um, in the first opportunity. Okay, we're gonna let this dry off a little bit, folks. And I'm, because this is a workshop, I'm probably, it, it, probably just gonna come over to you now and have a chat, see how you're getting on with this. Um, because otherwise, um, I don't want to work on this while it's still damp. That's another thing slightly different with acrylics. Um, uh, for some reason, they seem to sort of need a little bit more drying off time before you go back in. Unless you're working wet and wet, of course, which is what we did in the sky. You know, if you, if you think about it, we started with blue, warmed it up, then added um, in total three colours. So that was worked wet into wet. But um, there seems to be a slightly quicker drying time uh, with acrylics. And so you, once they have dried, you have to, you have to leave them a bit longer than you would a, a watercolor because it has to be, the, the, the next thing you do on this, it becomes more of a glaze than it does um, a wet on dry. The difference being, of course, is that acrylic is a plastic. It's a polymer, it's a liquid polymer with pigment in it. So you've created a film. You wouldn't get that from watercolor. Watercolor remains a matte porous surface. Um, but the more acrylic you put on a surface, the more you close that surface down and, and seal it. So it's, it's almost like painting on plastic with consecutive washes and colors rather than painting on a porous paper surface as you would with watercolor. So the first change for this stage is to go down a size in brush. So I'm going down to uh, a half inch flat, okay? Again, for those of you that want to know this particular brand, had this years, I, I don't, um, it's okay. You know, it's, a, it's not a bad brush. It's made by Dela Rowney and it's the graduate series. Um, but that, trust me, you can get, this one, uh, sorry, half inch flat in uh, most manufacturers in pro art. Um, we mentioned rosemary brushes. So um, this will just give us a little, just a little more um, dexterity, if you like, around our shapes. So is my paint still alive? I think it is because I've sprayed it. And we're just going to, we obviously need to make a green, don't we? I mean, it's a dark green for the background. So I, I'm, I'm starting with the uh, trees in the background, okay? As you'll see me go around our buildings. But if you look at that photo, really, the darkness of the buildings, okay? Um, it's very, very difficult uh, to differentiate between the darkness of the trees. I'm talking color here. The tone is obvious, it's very dark. Um, but in terms of color of that dark, um, it's very hard to tell the difference between what's the tree behind and the actual building in shadow. But um, that's really the limitations of a uh, photograph again. So what I'll probably do, and I'll explain as I'm doing it, I'll go for mostly a dark green in the trees, but when I get into the dark of the buildings, I'll probably introduce a little bit more warmth, you know, from the burnt sienna, sorry, from the raw sienna and uh, alizarin crimson, 
let's see how it goes. I, I almost want to deliberately make a mistake, you know, so you can see how we would fix it. So um, <laughs> as I said, that shouldn't be too difficult. Um, so let's start off with a green. That's ultramarine blue. And we'll go for a direct green. We'll go for the, the uh, yellow for the moment, the, um, the lemony yellow type color. Now that's gonna dry off very quickly that, okay? So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna spray it slightly. I've got a lot more moisture there in the mixing area. So that's a dark, cool green. Do wanna make quite a bit of it. I'm going to warm it up slightly with some raw sienna, more blue, and I'm, I'll keep going back and forth here until I get what I want. Volume is one thing, I need a lot of it. Back to that yellow. Now if I wanted to make this dark green even darker, my choice of colour to add to it would be the alizarin crimson, because when you're using opposites, uh, green and red are opposites. Um, as soon as the opposite goes in, it goes darker. Just to prove the point, take a little bit of a little crimson, and this will go even darker. Okay. Right. Okay. That's 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 a good starting point there. Fully load the brush. It's really important to uh, load the brush correctly. So I turn it over like this, making sure that, uh, you know, that the paint loading is not in one area of the brush only. It's evenly distributed uh, throughout the fibers of the brush. Okay, and I'm, I'm right-handed, so I'm gonna work from uh, left to right, so I'm not smudging anything as I go. And uh, count your brush strokes. I don't mean, you know, I don't mean sort of, perhaps I should say, be conscious of how many brush strokes you're applying. I don't want you to say one, two, three, four. <laughs> You'll forget what it is you're supposed to be doing. Um, but uh, the point I'm trying to make here is be economical. You don't want lots and lots of brush strokes. So if you want to suggest further little, um, further smaller um, hay bales in the background, leave those little spots at that level there above ground and you can you, the, the brain will fill the rest in the brain will say oh they must be more um hay bales i'm just going up i'm coming up to my first little building here now i've got a feeling that this building it's, it's difficult to tell but i've got a feeling that this building has actually got a chimney on it on the one end i'm gonna ignore that I don't, I, I don't see that as playing an important part, but you do want the angle of the roof just there, like that, okay? And here we go again, we're going through here. There's a hay bale, right there, my first, first hay bale. And down a little bit in places. As I say, the idea is that you create smaller little little glimmers of of light in the paint painted areas that can be other things, uh, further hay bales or smaller buildings or whatever. Um, now I'm working. I could come across in front of this um, to do the front face, the front elevation of this barn. Okay, about there. But I, I, I feel as though that should be warmed up slightly just to make it look a little different to the background. So I'll just take a small amount of the warmer colors. That's the raw sienna and the alizarin crimson, okay? And that can go into that side of that building just to show it off as looking a little bit different. And then it will have, even though we can't see the shape because the tonal value makes the um, shape of the building disappear into the background, uh, we still need to show off that angle there, that leading edge on this right hand side of the roof. And then we're back into picking up the dark green because immediately behind that, of course, is a tree. 
Now the the um, the photo shows um, trees with uh, sky gaps, you know, uh, gaps between the upper branches in some of these trees. Uh, that's that's entirely your choice. Um, if they occur in my paintings, it's more out of um, incidental, uh, accidental, if you like, uh, brushwork that allows for that to, to, to give that appearance. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to go looking to paint um, little, perfect little trees in the background that have Unless I get to my focal point, which I'm about to approach now, and maybe this tree here, perhaps we could do a little more finesse on this tree. Notice how I always take um, a little bit of the background tree over the corner of the top of the roof, you, because the brain, for some very strange reason, will uh, not do that. It wants to sort of stop like the tree is part of the building. The tree isn't part of the building. It lives beyond the um, the the um, the building itself, the edge of the building. So try and remember to, do, to to go slightly over the corner. Again, I'm going to warm that up a little bit. This front edge. So I just make a little mini mix on the side of my palette here, just to warm that up. And I've got this again. So I was saying about perhaps this tree here. Now this, this sorry, this is, let me just concentrate a little bit here. Um, this is my main hay bale, the one that's closest to us. So I'm going to go around this quite carefully here. Now with a little finger or a, a credit card, why don't we uh, scrape out a little sort of window in that, um, in that front wall, okay? Just scraped out a little window in the front wall of our um, building. And this is where I'm thinking about uh, taking a rigger brush. Now, my room's not very warm. It's not overly warm, let me put it that way. So um, this is already drying out a little. So I'm just going to spritz it spritz my paint and take the rigger brush and, and this is the, the only tree a little bit off there this is the only tree really that I'm going to break up and I'm dancing dancing over the surface like this to show um, that this tree has some space and some air about it OK, and I'll even, even though it's not showing in the photo, I'll even give a little white edge before it makes, um, rather than make contact, like it, like here, I lost the edge of that building in the background. But for this one here, down the slope of that roof at the back there, I just want to leave a little gap. A little more random around the edge. You know, you've got to make a random edge to these trees. Now that I've seen a little bit of that on this one, this side of that tree probably needs to copy it a little bit. Now, um, at ground level, it's that things get a bit easier again. So I'll go up to this roof, my next roof. There's still the tops of these hay bales down here. So it's, it's, it's just a little bit of, got to give some careful thought to, um, you know, the edge of the paintbrush. You need to know where the corner of that brush is all the time. Otherwise, you're going to lose things. You're going to lose the tops of your hay bales or not show them off, not make the right edge. There's the leading edge to that little building. I want to warm it up again. So I'm just taking the uh, alizarin and the raw sienna again in at the edge of this dark green puddle. That makes it a warmer dark green puddle. And uh, a little bit of warmth in the background as well here. 
here. And a little bit of warmth in that tree that we made a moment ago, just to give it some form. Now I'm adding water to this because really what I've done here is I've effectively I've, I've completed the tricky area. That's the focal point territory. Just making the top of that hay bale a little neater with the rigger brush, a little bit fiddly. Um, and down at ground level, if you want, you could run a couple of horizontal lines as though there's a fence back there. I'm using the rigger brush for this again through here. Let's continue um, in an, a, a right uh, direction. I think we'll go completely over this, this uh, little building. The gaps over the tops of the others might leave a little slither of light on that back uh, sloping roof for this one. Round the hay bales. Let's go a little bit more green again. So I'm just mixing up some fresh green. That's the uh, ultramarine blue and lemon. So I want to get back to that green effect because really all we're dealing with from here on in is uh, the trees in the background. Now, I quite like smudging with my finger sometimes. Just gives a little texture. And now I see these greens is looking a bit flat, some of them over here. So I'll take a little bit of the lemon yellow and just pop that in in one or two places. Careful not to overwork. And that's me saying that to myself. Um, now then, what about the height of your trees? Have you checked that out? Have you, have you made sure that the height of your trees don't all, all go up to the same height, okay? Look how they meander in terms of height, okay? There's no two clusters the same, really. Okay, so we've got the basics there of what we want. Let's find that a little bit too busy now, this tree over here. I, I, I always plumb for things that are slightly more geometrical in shape. If you look at the trees in the photo, some of them are quite pom-pom-like, quite rounded. I don't feel that, that this is just a personal thing. I don't feel as though that offers much in terms of dynamic. So I prefer to keep my trees mostly um, slightly more geometrical, I should say. Okay. That is to say they've got squared off edges in places. Um, what else can we do here? We could um, take the um, scraping card, okay, if you want. Don't go mad with this because there isn't much evidence of it in the, 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 the photograph, you know, but then that is the photograph. Um, so you could just scrape out the odd tree trunk if if it's right. Still too wet, isn't it, for me to do that? But uh, here and there. Now there's a telegraph post, I believe, right here um, in the photograph. Of course, that's this building is a little more central, only by three quarters of an inch or so, but it's a little more central. Okay, so I've got to try and sort of make. Um, I've got to steer away back from the center a little bit, okay, to, to this direction here. So what I'm going to do is use a vertical because everything's horizontal. I'm going to use this card to give me a, um, a telegraph post, okay, but it's not going to go where it is in the photo because that, again, would be too, too close to the center. I'm going to take it right to the edge of the building and just load up the edge of this card here like this. 
So you can see the edge of that card's got paint on it. And that's going to be my, might be too much on it. I'm just going to touch down that edge of card onto a piece of paper for a minute, because I think there's too much paint on there. Now I should be able to put it in. There we are. There's a perfect line just from the edge of the credit card. Um, again, the, it's, it's time for some creativity, okay? Because there's not much on offer um, as it stands at the moment, um, which again is, this is a, why I favor photographs like this. If it was full of information, you'd really be struggling to, uh, as to what to leave in, what to include, uh, what to uh, leave out rather. Um, so this gives you uh, plenty of room for ad lib. So, so we'll have another smaller, um, sorry, smaller, we'll have another um, telegraph post here. But I think I'm gonna put a, a telegraph post a little bit closer to us. Therefore, what, and by that, I mean, it's gonna be taller and it's gonna be about here. Okay, there we are. There's a telegraph post that's coming towards us. But look, it wasn't it wasn't put in that position, you know, randomly without thought. It's on the grid line, isn't it, more or less? So if we did have our grid in place, look at where that telegraph post falls. It's almost directly on, if not directly on, the uh, the left-hand vertical grid line. Okay. Right. I think we've got to let that dry off a little bit though it might be an idea to put the shadowed sides of our um, hay bales in while, while we're at it. Um, and in fact, yeah, um, shadowed side of our hay bales and the, the grassy ravine um, as well. Now what I'm going to draw your attention to before I do it is this. Um, we're going to um, leave little slithers of light around the edges of things. I'll just show you, I'll demonstrate exactly what I mean here. I'm using the warmer mix. That's the um, raw sienna. Let's take a little bit of burnt sienna for this, okay? Because that's even warmer again. And as these hay bales are closer to us than the buildings, then we'd expect the warmth to increase. So I'm just putting out a little bit of burnt sienna, not much. Um, and into that, I can use this green puddle with more blue. So we've got a nice dark warm color there. Could put a, a little bit of alizarin crimson in there, giving us a sort of burnt orange type uh, color. And we'll start with the main one here, which is quite thick paint. And I'll just shape, and this is what I mean. Let me just home in on this going close because I want to show you exactly what I'm doing here. What I'm talking about here is leaving a little slither of light around the curvature of the hay bale on the far side. Okay, but don't don't, whatever you do, don't make it a, a clean edge at the bottom. It's, it, it's obscured by the grasses in front of it, remember, okay? So a nice rough broken edge here. Now the other hay bales, just a, no more than a little nick of the brush. Little just touch down here. And even if you haven't created a hay bale, um, by leaving out white, um, the white shape, you can still infer that there's one just by giving it a dark edge like that somewhere. There's additional hay bales like there, or back there somewhere. Okay. Um, now then the, um, what you're about to see now is very much, uh, as much perhaps as a watercolor technique that I'm gonna show you. Um, and that is, we're gonna do this grassy uh, ravine, okay, uh, here. 
but we're going to uh, use the belly of the brush. And that's what I mean by it being a, a water, as much a watercolor technique as, as an acrylic uh, painting technique. So I'm loading the six round brush, the size six round brush, okay? And I'm using the belly, of the brush. The grasses in the photo seem to be falling like this, if you look at them. There's definitely a nap, if you like, to the grass, the growth of the grasses. Um, I'm not sure how important that is, but it probably is important, otherwise I wouldn't have noticed it. Um, I, th I think therefore, so it's funny, these are the subtle things that, that you need to be sensitive to. Um, they sort of go, it's like a wave going that way. And I'm wondering whether, because we've got the hay bales doing, giving us a, a movement message from left to right, those, those hay bales are definitely giving us a, a, a message of movement. And that is a left to right movement. Whereas the grasses, if they sweep this way, are gonna, that's gonna look awkward, I think, potentially. So we either go with the left to right um, uh, nap in the grasses, or we keep them vertical. And the vertical would be a neutral, so it would work. I'm going to try um, just going with with the the left to right sweep there. So opposite to, to what's actually in the photo. Okay. Leave gaps. Make sure to leave gaps. Don't just go across your piece of paper um, filling this in like it's a wall. It's not. You know these are these things grow randomly. Broken areas. My own palette is getting in the way there, so. And I'll even bring them down because I think it'd be better if we made these, this grassy edge look a little bit closer to us. Run out of paint. It's good though, if it, when your brush is running out of paint, you get the best, um, you know, hit and miss delivery. You get that real textural delivery of paint. So don't just automatically reload the brush just because it's showing signs of running out of paint. Now it's all one color, isn't it? So I'm dunking my brush uh, in water and I'm picking up something warmer, raw sienna, not burnt sienna, raw sienna. Let's get you back in focus. So I've just warmed up these grasses and I've just gone along like this with the belly of the brush, okay? Um, now there's another way of doing that. You could just use a single brush stroke. You could load up, you know, a big one inch brush there like this. You could go through here, uh, there's something like that. And then, of course, you could um, scrape out what, uh, you could scrape out all those little um, areas that I've just been creating by using the belly of the round brush. So it's your your shout, you know. There's there's always more than one way of doing these things. And I think we're going to take a break here, folks. Um, a, you know, a, a coffee break, tea break, whatever. I want to show you in the next stage um, what color. Obviously, what the, the you know we need to apply a color to the tops of the bales because it doesn't look great with white. This is this is perhaps um, a bit of a difference too between um the uh watercolor and acrylic um the white bare paper doesn't work that well with acrylics i find um so we will choose a color a nice warm color for the roofs and i want to show you how to glaze um over the foreground okay when we get back and and that'll be good timing because it'll give that initial wash good length of time to uh, dry off because you don't want to be glazing on damp anything that's still damp and put it picking up clean water cleanish water and that's probably can't see that but uh, you have to trust me on this i'm putting water in this and i'm going to take some raw sienna 
and we're just creating a glaze, okay? A little bit more. Don't want it too strong. You can always strengthen it, remember, okay? You're better off going too weak than too strong with this. And make sure there's none of those nasty pigments stuck in the fibers of the brush. This is really quite easy, but um, what I want you to do is stay off, stay off the top of the field. By the top of the field, I mean perhaps the width of a brush handle here, you know. So this glaze is going to uh, be applied from about here downwards. But we're also going to go over the tops of the roofs of the buildings and the um, bales of uh, hay themselves. So actually, let, let's start up here. Go over the tops of those buildings just a very gentle the, the great this is the, one of the great things about acrylic unlike watercolor now you don't have to worry about moving uh, color that was already underneath unless it's still wet of course and it might have been there look on that little building with mine i think there was a little glimmer of wet acrylic paint somewhere around there but um you know no no biggie uh, it does normally dry off really quickly so just check your painting for any little pockets of still wet acrylic paint or speed dry it um but then the gentlest of uh, brush strokes over the hay bales like this that's the very top of a hay bale you could leave a little bit white if there's anything i miss or accidentally do when I'm doing this, um, there's always the option to pick up a little bit of a mix of paint with a bit of white in it and uh, put those highlights back. So as I said, stay off the top of the field, but if you can see here, this is, this is where I'm gonna add the glaze from here down. Okay, I'm running out of paint, reload. Pick up where I left off, run to here. So only the top of the field now, it's got the original, um, it's got the original coat of paint, if you like. Now that's quite a hard line. It might look subtle at the moment, but trust me, as it dries out, it'll go, it'll look harder and harder. So I just affect it by touching it with um, my finger. And I'm talking about the, the, the top edge of that glaze that I just made. Now I'll get down to here. I could leave I'm hoping that I might leave just a couple of glimmers of the paler initial wash in places. You know, sort of here, little build up of, um, of paint in places as a bead there, help that down through the foreground. And now what I'll do in here while it's still wet, this is very much like watercolor. I'll pick up a little bit of um, the ultramarine blue a small amount of ultramarine blue find somewhere on your palette where you can just get it onto the brush like that it's okay if you make contact with the yellow pedal that's in your in your palette that's okay but that little bit of blue there now if i take the blade of the brush like this okay and just run through the the immediate foreground a few times here like this this is wet in wet just like we would if we were um, painting in watercolor, of course. And that little, those little streaks, those weak streaks of, of um, ultramarine blue, just give a little bit of form to the foreground. I like to sort of bring it right down to the bottom actually usually. So just cool off that immediate bottom area like that. And, it, and what that little bit of cool does, it makes the warm look even warmer, okay? Now you might need a little bit of this in um, in the grasses, not too much. And I'm going to have a little bit of fun with this grassy area now. Um, I'm going to put a bit more colour into it because it's gone. My my grasses there have gone very grey. Okay, from just demonstrating what I was doing and the different methods. So I'm going to pick up a bit of the uh, bright yellow, the lemon yellow. A little bit of the blue, make a green again. I want it to be, I want a fair bit of yellow in this. I don't want too much blue in it. And I'm just going to spice up a couple of areas in the grasses here with that green, just hit and miss here and here and there. This adds a slightly nicer color to the whole painting. Okay. 
can go into the background in some of those trees with the same color. We want too much back there because saturated color like this, which it is, um, you know, doesn't show up that much at distance. So only put a tiny bit of this color in the background. Okay. Now I'm going to clean this palette off because what I'm going to do next uh, um, is not going to be uh, it's not going to be easy to achieve with all that water in the mix. So there it goes. So that was that was a glaze. Other than what I did in the grasses, that little bit of extra green, that uh, initial wa wash is a glaze. And a glaze, of course, as it suggests, is just um, a thin wash of colour. Um, it sits on top of uh, the other colours. Um, and glazes can be really, really useful with acrylics because if you go too bright, for instance, in an area, imagine if we'd uh, used too much of the lemon yellow in that foreground and thought, you know, it's just too artificial looking, then you'd mix up probably the same colors we just used, the raw sienna uh, into a glaze as we just did, and you would tame that bright yellow back, okay, to something more uh, realistic, something more acceptable. Um, so the glazes are very, very useful. You can use glazes in watercolor, but the thing is, um, in watercolor, you really have to make sure that each, it's a long, long process. If you're using multiple glazes in watercolor, you have to make sure that each glaze is dried out. And I mean, really dried out up to 24 hours between each glaze, or you can speed dry it. Um, but with speed drying, you're never guaranteed that it's fully dry. Okay, folks, um, what I'm gonna do now is check for uh, any sort of uh, little pockets of still wet paint. So I'm just taking a tissue and knocking them out a little bit there. And I think it would be good if we gave a little bit of special spice colour to perhaps um, our nearer uh, hay bale. So I've got the six size six round brush in my hand. And uh, to get a to get a, an orangey colour, we, we can use a bit of um, alizarin crimson. Could use just orange, of course. If you if you want to invest in a tube of cadmium orange, um, that would be the shortcut. But I like to show people how to mix colours as well. So that's a bit of alizarin crimson. Into that, I put a little bit of raw sienna. Okay. Again, you have other options. You could use burnt sienna. Okay, uh, be careful with the yellow. The obvious one might be the yellow. You think red and yellow will make an orange, but be careful with a um, opaque yellow because it will actually um, dull it down a bit. Okay, right. So here goes. I'm just going to put a small amount of that orangey color into that just going to take a little bit of raw sienna on its own look. I keep that separate over here in a separate puddle. And into that, I'll just add that here. So I'm, so I'm mixing on the paper. That gives you a, a, a warmer looking hay bale there. So the others now will need a, a much weaker version of that. So I put a lot of water into the edge of this puddle that I made, this colour. And uh, we'll just hit one or two of the others that are close-ish. Okay. So we're inventing where, uh, you know, this is us making these decisions, not the photograph. It's nothing to do with the photograph. Um, this is us making the art. Um, so I'm just playing around with that color a little bit. Don't want to fiddle with it too much. I'm going to spatter a little bit too. So a little bit of the same color. The color I just used in this hay bale, I'll spatter into the foreground. And now I'm probably going to lift a little bit off the top. I've squeezed this brush out, this little brush that I've been using. I've squeezed all the paint and water out of it over the water tub, OK? It's now a thirsty brush. And I'm going to put back the highlight at the top of that hay bale. 
just by running a thirsty brush over the top there. Look at that. It really gives the hay bale three, a sense of three dimension when you remove the paint to reveal the light. And, it, and if your paint seeps back in to where you just took it out from, it's a bit like digging a, a, a hole in a, in, a, in a muddy field when it's still raining. It'll quickly fill up again. So what you do is you do it a second time like this. Repeat the process. Take everything, even though you thought it was only a small amount of paint and water you just took off, get rid of it. Clean the brush again and do that process again until that top of that hay bale stays pale. OK. There we are. If it does it, if you've got to do it a third time, you've got to do it a third time. But it's well worth it. It um, really gives a sense of form to your to your objects. Does this roof need a little bit of that colour? Uh, be a little bit careful. The near end here, one swipe of the brush like that gives a little bit of texture. Very subtle. Don't even know whether you pick that up on the on this um, this. I think you should. I'm looking at my monitor screen. Yeah, I think you just see the that just about registers that little hit of on the near end of this this roof. I just ran the same color down here. Um, okay. Now I'm looking to pick up the rigger brush and get some white on the go. So let's put some white. I dare put that on my painting and not spoil it. So I'm just picking up a bit of white paint and just taking a little bit of white paint here. Don't want too much. Just going to roll the rigger brush. So the rigger brush with lots of water in it, like this, roll, roll the fibers of the rigger brush around. If I put it over that dark bit of paint, you can see what I've done there. I've just loaded two thirds of that um, brush. I'll do it again. Roll. Make sure you, there's plenty of water in the rigger brush, and you're rolling it around like this. There it is. Um, so a little bit of white spatter here. It's summer, remember, and you can imagine somewhere like a hayfield in all that dry, strawy environment with all the straw hanging around. Um, there's all sorts of airborne particles, um, and I will also use this to suggest in front of some of these buildings, a little fence. Um, if you're putting in a fence, whatever you do, don't put in um, horizontals and verticals in equal amounts. Most of my fences, if you think about it, the, the re only reason why you see a fence at different a distance, that's a, you know, a, a railed fence, a piece of wood horizontal, is you only see the horizontals, okay? So you only see the horizontal part of the fence. That's simply because Anything vertical is not reflecting the light, okay? Unless the light is low in the sky. So the only thing you should concern yourself with on a, 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 for, to create a fence is the horizontal, because it's only the tops of horizontals that pick up the light. All about light. Painting, you, when you get to this stage, it becomes all about the light direction, um, it's really mostly above us. If you look at the um, if you look at the photo, there's not much evidence of uh, of, of shadows co coming traveling. Now, sorry, there's not much evidence of shadows running across the floor of the ground, is there? So that suggests that the light is more or less straight overhead. Okay, it could be behind us, and the shadows could be behind the hay bales. That's a possibility. And that would explain why the roofs of the buildings are illuminated with light. So it could be behind us. Um, but it's certainly not from the side, because we would see, if it was, we would see the, um, the shadows running um, along the ground. Now, um, so yeah, so there's no shadows per se. But having said that, I like shadows because you look at these poor little isolated shapes, OK? There's nothing connecting them. So in a moment, when, I've done, when I'm done with this white, um, uh, the rigger brush and the white, in a moment, I think it would be a good idea to uh, suggest the light is actually coming from the left over here. That would mean that would still be OK for the uh, illuminated roofs. Um, but it will allow us to join some of these hay bales together. I'll show you what I mean in a moment. Let me just enjoy a little bit more work with the um, white paint.
So I'll continue the bottom of the telegraph post going to the dark with the white paint. Uh, there might be cables going towards it. There might be a few other vertical uh, uh, bits and pieces uh, around the scene. But this is very, you know, this is very intuitive. So it's just suggesting things. When you get a strong horizontal, as we have in a typical landscape, okay, the, the landscape, the story of this image is screaming out for something opposite. So that's why we choose to put in um, telegraph posts, because they're the little bit of um, vertical against all that horizontal. So I'm going to put some cables, uh, and I'm picking up here ultramarine blue and burnt sienna, okay? But because I don't want these cables to look too hard, that would look really artificial. If, if, if I use this dark mix that I've just created now on here, um, that would look too hard. In watercolor, you just use water to thin it down. But I'm going to use a little bit of white into that. I've created a gray. That's too pale now. So I've got to go back the other way a little bit. Both, this, both colors in there again. That's it. I've got a sort of purpley gray color there, OK? A warm gray. Um, now then, if you're not confident freehand, uh, doing freehand cables like this, I'm going to show you how to do it. You could use the, you could use the edge of the card, you know, you could just sort of take the edge of the card if you can get flat enough to that surface of the paint and use that. That works okay. Um, but, uh, you know, I must, uh, it would be, I'd be a rubbish uh, tutor if I didn't show you how to do it freehand. So, you go in, you hold your rigger brush as though it's an extension of your index finger like this, okay? And when you're ready, you go in close, you take, you hold your breath for a couple of seconds. And when you're ready, and, and look at, I just hover off the surface by about somewhere between an inch and three quarters of an inch. When I'm ready, I hold my breath. Everything locks up on the body except the fingers here, except the hand. And you just go in. And I can't talk. There's no way I could talk while I'm doing that because it would go everywhere. So just to show you again over here, I've got to be really careful with this because it's so far away. We probably wouldn't see the um, cables, but I'll show you anyway. So you go in close and when you're ready, hold your breath. And just move as little of, of your arm as possible. OK. Um, now, there are further embellishments you can make. It's really up to you now. This is, none of this is, uh, is according to any rule. Um, rules are out the window, creativity and imagination take over. So I mentioned the lines of uh, shadow between the bales using the same color, okay? Let's say if I had to describe this color, it's only, it's only the, it's only the, um, really, the, the three colors. That's ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, and a little bit of uh, white. You could add a little bit of alizarin crimson if you want to take it more plummy in color, because that shadow color is going to be a warm, a, a warmish plummy color. Now, let's say then that the light is coming from the left. Um, and when you've, where you've got a couple of hay bales that are close-ish together, you can run those shadows as though they make contact, the hay bales are making contact with each other. Like as, uh, as I'm doing here, that was a bit heavy handed, but that's because I'm talking while I'm doing it. Um, so that one there, but it's great, Re really does sew everything together. You know, it really does combine. Um, I'll, I'll, I will go in close, so you'll, have to t you'll have to remind me to zoom back out afterwards. Um, but you'll see what I mean when you when you take a shadow across the ground like this. One object, hay bale, makes contact with the next hay bale, and that, as I say, really helps to um, to, to put uh, a form again on the scene. And we're really not far off the finish here, folks. What about some extra? What the one or two extra grasses, if you like, okay, or the the, the flower heads of something wild growing out of the um, of the foreground here.
tap a little bit of that dark mix again around here. And we're really there. Is there anything else I could add to this? Um, not really. Um, I think that suffices, you know, it, it, it's, so let me just uh, evaluate this now as though, as though you folks weren't there and I wasn't teaching. Okay, this is really me now. And I want you to, so, to, so you can see how exactly, truthfully see how I uh, evaluate uh, my painting, my work at this stage, near, at, at the end. Um, first of all, I will, I will look at the whole. You know, I stop looking at the miniature. I stop looking at the little post. I stop looking at each hay bale. I just want to know whether the whole scene is working as a unit. And the best way to do that, the easiest way to do that, of course, is to isolate it with a mount. So by putting the mount around my painting, um, it, it just allows you to see it better, okay? I suppose edges are very distracting. So this gets rid of the edge. So let's, let's look at the major things we need to consider when we're producing a painting, a balanced painting. Um, uh, light and dark, dynamics. Well, we've got that. We've got a nice light pale sky, pale foreground. Uh, and the paleness of the background, the sky and the foreground sandwiches all the other tonal values, doesn't it? It really squeezes them into this area here. Um, so I'm happy with the tonal exchanges. I'm happy with the color temperatures. I feel as though my dark um, greens over here uh, are dark and they're not warm greens, okay? Um, you can't use warm greens against warm foregrounds. They have to be cool greens because they're in the distance. Uh, information, is it entertaining enough? You know, um, I think so, because I, I, I've really, if you look at this, if you keep looking at this, you keep going around it, around it, but you're always, I hope, going to settle around here, aren't you? Because one, it's the biggest building. And it's the biggest area of light against the biggest area of dark off this roof. This hay bale also sort of comes in our direction. So it's keeping you here rather than going off over there or going off over there. Whoops. Um, the vertical, the tallest thing on the painting is in the right place. It's here in the focal point area, which further helps to nail the fo focal point. It's the only vertical, it's the only real um, vertical in the whole of the design. So, yeah, I'm happy with that. Um, I think the tonal exchange, I think the texture, the foreground, foregrounds that can be deceptively difficult. Okay, he, here's the rule of thumb about foregrounds um, they must be neither too busy nor too bland. Okay, and I, I'm, I'm sorry that that sounds like such a generalization. But it's true. Um, if you put, if you think of, there's quite a bit of texture here, right, around this area here, um, created through the trees in the background and the hay bales, little inferences of uh, fences in front of the buildings. It's quite a bit of busy, busyness and texture there. Now, if you weren't really busy in your foreground, you're not going to want to look at that painting because it's overload. It's visual overload that the eye does not get. Um, it, 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 you just won't want to look at it, okay? So you have to, you, you have to keep certain things for certain areas in your painting. So the foreground, just we, we, we've got a little gap in the foreground, by the way, and that's not by any sort of accidental idea. That that that's a way of letting you get through here. Um, you walk up to the edge here. You can walk into that field. Always put yourself in the position of a real person looking at this scene you're actually there okay um trust me if you went through here with a brick wall that had no gap in it um that set that painting no matter how good the painting is behind that wall how well you've painted it behind that wall your view is going to be i i i can't access this painting there's a big message saying stone wall stay out okay so gaps that's why gaps in the foreground are really important 
Um, but the, it's understated and it's not overstated. So beware of over texturize, texturizing um, your foreground. Always allow for a way through. If you're putting, if you're using something like this, had we have just stuck um, closer to the original photo, I mean, look at the photo. That that grassy verge or that ravine, whatever it is, it's the the edge, the grassy edge there, is much higher up in the mix. It hides some of the um, the hay bales. Well, I felt the need to show it separately because that gave us a little bit more dynamic behind. Um, with that, you know, you, you could, you, I, I, I it, that was a personal thing. Um, I, I would maybe be tempted to do another version and take it up, but I'm pretty certain I would come back to this version of dropping that down a slightly lower than it is in, in the photograph. So what else is there to consider? Um, the overall works, so, so that the, the overall unit works, it's cohesive. Um, and then it's the detail. Finally, it's the detail. And I think it's okay. Uh, you know, is that is the end of this ba hay bale here? Um, it's getting my attention for some reason. Don't always know why, but it is. So I have to think about it. And why am I looking at that and one, wondering whether it's right or not? Could be because it's a little bit flat. So I take a little bit of white and a little bit of burnt sienna, okay? A little bit of that dirt that we used on the, on the um, shadow and just touch in a little bit of opaque because there was white in this mix, remember? And take a little bit of opaque to that. Subtle as it might be, okay? And I will move in close in a moment. Subtle as that might be, um, it just helps to take the flatness out of that, the end of that hay bale. Right, let me just home in then and show you this up close. Um, so I'm just moving this around a little bit so you can see it, a slightly better version of it, okay? But um, look at how, you know, the play of water in acrylic paints can be really useful. Um, and I think it's a better effect in some respects than it is in watercolor, unless, you know, when I say painting in acrylics helps you understand watercolor better, look how much paint you have to use to get that effect of having water play its part in the paint when it's on the surface. Now, it's easier to spot when you are, um, that, that particular thing issue is easier to spot when you're working in acrylics, but it's what you should be doing with your watercolors as well. Using more paint, don't be mean with the paint. That's the way you get lift outs and um, textual shapes. You don't really do it other than the odd touch of a brush in those areas, but it gives depth. Hmm. Um, so yeah, so, so over on the left, there's not much out on the peripheral here. Over on the right, there's not much to write home about over here. It's all played down. It's all, you know, much, um, it's subdued over here. It's always about the focal point territory like this here, okay? <laughs>